What's going on in America today? Why are we over our heads in debt? Why can't the politicians bring debt under control? Why are so many people, often both parents now, working at low-paying, dead-end jobs and still making do with less? What's the future of the American economy and way of life? Why does the government tell us inflation is low when the buying power of our paychecks is declining at an alarming rate? Only a generation ago, bread was a quarter, and you could get a new car for 1995. The problem is that since 1864, we've had a debt-based banking system. All our money is based on government debt. We cannot extinguish government debt without extinguishing our money supply. That's why talk of paying off the national debt without reforming our banking system is an impossibility. That's why the solution does not lie in discussing the size of the national debt, rather it lies in reforming our banking system. This is the Federal Reserve headquarters in Washington. It sits on this very impressive address, right on Constitution Avenue, right across from the Lincoln Memorial. But is it federal? Is it really part of the United States government? Well, what we're about to show you is that there's nothing federal about the Federal Reserve, and there are no reserves. The name is a deception created back before the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913 to make Americans think that America's central bank operates in the public interest. The truth is that the Federal Reserve is a private bank owned by private stockholders and run purely for their private profit. That's exactly correct. The uh, Fed is a privately owned for-profit corporation, which uh, again has no reserves, at least no reserves available to back up the Federal Reserve notes, which is our common currency. Oh, absolutely. The Federal Reserve is neither federal and has doubtful reserves. It's a private bank that is owned by member banks and uh, it was chartered uh, under the guise of deceit by an act of Congress in 1913. If there's still any doubt whether the Federal Reserve is a part of the U.S. government, check your local telephone book. In most cities, it is not listed in the blue government pages. It is listed in the business white pages right next to Federal Express, another private company. But more directly, U.S. courts have ruled time and time again that the Fed is a private corporation. Why can't Congress do something about the Fed? Most members of Congress just don't understand the system, and the few who do are afraid to speak up. For example, initially a veteran congressman from Chicago asked us if he could be interviewed for this video. However, both times our camera crew arrived at his office to do the interview, this was all we were able to film. The congressman never appeared and eventually decided he no longer wanted to participate. But a few others in Congress have been bolder over the years. Here are three quick examples. In 1923, Representative Charles A. Lindbergh, a Republican from Minnesota and father of the famed aviator Lucky Lindy, Put it this way, the financial system has been turned over to the Federal Reserve Board. That board administers the finance system by authority of a purely profiteering group. The system is private, conducted for the sole purpose of obtaining the greatest possible profits from the use of other people's money. One of the most outspoken critics in Congress of the Fed was the former chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee during the Great Depression years. Louis T. McFadden, Republican of Pennsylvania, said in 1932, We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board. This evil institution has impoverished the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Senator Barry Goldwater was a frequent critic of the Fed. Most Americans have no real understanding of the operation of the international money lenders. The accounts of the Federal Reserve System have never been audited. It operates outside the control of Congress and manipulates the credit of the United States. The Federal Reserve really 
even though it is not part of the federal government, it is more powerful than the federal government. It's more powerful than the president, the Congress, and the courts. Now, a lot of people challenge me on that, but let me prove my case. The Federal Reserve determines what the average person's car payment is going to be, what their house payment is going to be, and whether they have a job or not. And I submit to you that that's total control. And the Federal Reserve is the largest single creditor of the United States government. What does Proverbs tell us? The borrower is servant to the lender. What one has to understand is that from the day the Constitution was adopted right up to today, the folks who profit from privately owned central banks, as Madison called them, the money changers, have fought a running battle for control over who gets to print America's money. Why is who prints the money so important? Think of money as just another commodity. If you have a monopoly on a commodity that everyone needs, everyone wants, and nobody has enough of, there are lots of ways to make a profit and also exert tremendous political influence. That's what this battle is all about. Throughout the history of the United States, the money power has gone back and forth between Congress and some sort of privately owned central bank. The Founding Fathers knew the evils of a privately owned central bank. First of all, they had seen how the privately owned British central bank, the Bank of England, had run up the British national debt to such an extent that Parliament had been forced to place unfair taxes on the American colonies. In fact, as we'll see later, Ben Franklin claimed that this was the real cause of the American Revolution. Most of the Founding Fathers realized the potential dangers of banking and feared bankers' accumulation of wealth and power. Jefferson put it this way, I sincerely believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. That succinct statement of Jefferson is, in fact, the solution to all our economic problems today. It bears repeating. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. James Madison, the main author of the Constitution, agreed. Interestingly, he called those behind the central bank scheme money changers. Madison strongly criticized their actions. History records that the money changers have used every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit, and violent means possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. The battle over who gets to issue our money has been the pivotal issue throughout the history of the United States. Wars are fought over it, depressions are caused to acquire it. Yet after World War I, this battle was rarely mentioned in newspapers or history books. Why? By World War I, the money changers, with their dominant wealth, had seized control of most of the nation's press. Throughout U.S. history, this battle over who gets the power to issue our money has raged. In fact, it's changed hands back and forth eight times since 1764. Yet this fact has virtually vanished from public view for over three generations behind a smokescreen emitted by Fed cheerleaders in the media. Until we stop talking about deficits and government spending, and start talking about who controls how much money we have, it's all just a big shell game, a complete and utter deception. It won't matter if you pass an ironclad amendment to the Constitution mandating a balanced budget. Our situation is only going to get worse until we root out the cause at its source. What's the solution for our national problem? First of all, education. That's what this video presentation is all about. But secondly, we must act. We must take back the power to issue our own money. Issuing our own money is not a radical solution. I want to stress that. It's the same solution used at different points in U.S. history by men like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and Abraham Lincoln. So, to sum it up, in 1913, 
Congress gave an independent central bank, deceptively named the Federal Reserve, a monopoly over issuing America's money. And the debt generated by this quasi-private corporation is what is killing the American economy. Though the Federal Reserve is now the most powerful central bank in the world, it was not the first. So where did this idea come from? To really understand the magnitude of the problem, we have to travel back to Europe. Just who are these money changers James Madison spoke of? In the Bible, 2,000 years ago, Jesus drove the money changers from the temple. It was the only time Jesus used force during his ministry. What were money changers doing in the temple? When Jews came to Jerusalem to pay their temple tax, they could only pay it with a special coin, the half shekel of the sanctuary. This was a half ounce of pure silver about this size. It was the only coin around at that time which was pure silver and of assured weight without the image of a pagan emperor. Therefore, to Jews, the half shekel was the only coin acceptable to God. But these coins were not plentiful. The money changers had cornered the market on them. Then they raised the price, just like any other commodity, to whatever the market would bear. In other words, money changers were making exorbitant profits because they held a virtual monopoly on money. The Jews had to pay whatever they demanded. To Jesus, this totally violated the sanctity of God's house. But the money-changing scam did not originate in Jesus' day. 200 years before Christ, Rome was having trouble with money changers. Two early Roman emperors had tried to diminish the power of the money changers by reforming usury laws and limiting land ownership to 500 acres. They were both assassinated. In 48 BC, Julius Caesar took back the power to coin money from the money changers and minted coins for the benefit of all. With this new, plentiful supply of money, he built great public works projects. By making money plentiful, Caesar won the love of the common man. But the money changers hated him. Some believe this was an important factor in Caesar's assassination. One thing is for sure, with the death of Caesar came the demise of plentiful money in Rome. Taxes increased, as did corruption. Just as in the case of America today, usury and debased coin became the rule. Eventually, the Roman money supply was reduced by 90%. As a result, the common people lost their lands and their homes, just as is about to happen soon in America. With the demise of plentiful money, the masses lost confidence in the Roman government and refused to support it. Rome plunged into the gloom of the Dark Ages. A thousand years after the death of Christ, money changers, those who loan out and manipulate the quantity of money, were active in medieval England. In fact, they were so active that acting together, they could manipulate the entire English economy. These were not bankers per se. The money changers generally were the goldsmiths. They were the first bankers because they started keeping other people's gold for safekeeping in their vaults. The first paper money was merely a receipt for gold left at the goldsmith. Paper money caught on because it was more convenient than carrying around a lot of heavy gold and silver coins. Eventually, goldsmiths noticed that only a small fraction of the depositors ever came in and demanded their gold at any one time goldsmiths started cheating on the system. They discovered that they could print more money than they had gold, and usually no one would be the wiser. Then they could loan out this extra money and collect interest on it. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking, that is, loaning out many times more money than you have assets on deposit. So, if $1,000 in gold were deposited with them, they could loan out about $10,000 in paper money and draw interest payments on it, and no one would ever discover the deception. 
By this means, goldsmiths gradually accumulated more and more wealth and used this wealth to accumulate more and more gold. Today, this practice of loaning out more money than there are reserves is known as fractional reserve banking. Every bank in the United States is allowed to loan out at least 10 times more money than they actually have. That's why they get rich on charging, let's say, 8% interest. It's not really 8% per year, which is their income. It's 80%. That's why bank buildings are always the largest in town. But does that mean that all interest or all banking should be illegal? Hardly. In the Middle Ages, canon law, the law of the Catholic Church, forbade charging interest on loans. This concept followed the teachings of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. They taught that the purpose of money was to serve the members of society to facilitate the exchange of goods needed to lead a virtuous life. Interest, in their belief, hindered this purpose by putting an unnecessary burden on the use of money. In other words, interest was contrary to reason and justice. Reflecting church law in the Middle Ages, Europe forbade charging interest on loans and made it a crime called usury. As commerce grew and therefore opportunities for investment arose in the late Middle Ages, it came to be recognized that to loan money had a cost for the lender, both in risk and in lost opportunity. So some charges were allowed, but not interest per se. But all moralists, no matter what religion, condemn fraud, oppression of the poor, and injustice as clearly immoral. As we will see, fractional reserve lending is rooted in a fraud, results in widespread poverty, and reduces the value of everyone else's money. The ancient goldsmiths discovered that extra profits could be made by rowing the economy between easy money and tight money. When they made money easier to borrow, then the amount of money in circulation expanded. Money was plentiful. People took out more loans to expand their businesses. But then the money changers would tighten the money supply. They would make loans more difficult to get. What would happen? Just what happens today? A certain percentage of people could not repay their previous loans and could not take out new loans to repay the old ones. Therefore, they went bankrupt and had to sell their assets to the goldsmiths for pennies on the dollar. The same thing is still going on today. Only today, we call this rowing of the economy up and down the business cycle. Like Julius Caesar, King Henry I of England finally resolved to take the money power away from the goldsmiths about 1100 A.D. Henry could have used anything as money, seashells, feathers, or even yak dung, as is often done in remote Tibetan provinces. But he invented one of the most unusual money systems in history. It was called the tally stick system. Here I have one of the few surviving examples of this form of British money, which lasted 726 years until 1826, a tally stick. The tally system was adopted to avoid the monetary manipulation of the goldsmiths. Tally sticks were money fabricated out of sticks of polished wood. Notches were cut along one edge of the stick to indicate the denominations. Then the stick was split lengthwise through the notches so that both pieces uh, still had a record of the notches. The king kept one half to protect against counterfeiting. Then he would spend the other half into the economy and they would circulate as money. This particular tally stick is huge. It represented 25,000 pounds. One of the original stockholders in the Bank of England purchased his original shares with this stick. In other words, he bought shares in the world's richest and most powerful corporation with a stick of wood. It's ironic that after its formation in 1694, the Bank of England attacked the tally stick system because it was money outside the power of the money changers, just as King Henry had wanted it to be. Why do people accept sticks of wood for money? 
That's a great question. Throughout history, people traded anything they thought had value and used as money. You see, the secret is that money is only what people agree on to use as money. What's our paper money today? It's really just paper. But here's the trick. King Henry ordered that tally sticks had to be used to pay the king's taxes. This built-in demand for tally sticks immediately made them circulate and be accepted as money. And they worked well. In fact, no other form of money has worked so well for so long as tally sticks. Keep in mind, the British Empire was built under the tally stick system. The tally stick system succeeded despite the fact that the money changers constantly attacked it by offering the metal coin system as competition. In other words, metal coins never went completely out of circulation, but tally sticks hung on because they were good for the payment of taxes. Finally, in the 1500s, King Henry VIII relaxed the laws concerning usury, and the money changers wasted no time reasserting themselves. They quickly made their gold and silver money plentiful for a few decades. But when Queen Mary took the throne and tightened the usury laws again, the money changers renewed the hoarding of gold and silver coins, forcing the economy to plummet. When Queen Mary's sister, Queen Elizabeth I, took the throne, she was determined to regain control over English money. Her solution was to issue gold and silver coins from the public treasury and take the control over the money supply away from the money changers. Although control over money was not the only cause of the English Revolution in 1642, religious differences fueled the conflict, monetary policy played a major role. Financed by the money changers, Oliver Cromwell finally overthrew King Charles, purged the parliament, and put the king to death. The money changers were immediately allowed to consolidate their financial power. The result was that for the next 50 years, the money changers plunged Great Britain into a series of costly wars. They took over a square mile of property in the center of London, known as the City of London. This area today is still known as one of the three predominant financial centers of the world. Conflicts with the Stuart Kings led the money changers in England to combine with those in the Netherlands to finance the invasion of William of Orange, who overthrew the Stuarts in 1688 and took the English throne. By the end of the 1600s, England was in financial ruin. Fifty years of more or less continuous wars with France and Holland had exhausted her. Frantic government officials met with the money changers to beg for the loans necessary to pursue their political purposes. The price was high. A government-sanctioned, privately-owned bank which could issue money created out of nothing. It was to be the modern world's first privately owned central bank, the Bank of England. Although it was deceptively called the Bank of England to make the general population think it was part of the government, it was not. Like any other private corporation, the Bank of England sold shares to get started. The investors, whose names were never revealed, were supposed to put up one and a quarter million British pounds in gold coin to buy their shares in the bank, but only 750,000 pounds was ever received. Despite that, the bank was duly chartered in 1694 and started out in the business of loaning out several times the money it supposedly had in reserves, all at interest. In exchange, the new bank would loan British politicians as much of the new currency as they wanted, as long as they secured the debt by direct taxation of the British people. So, legalization of the Bank of England amounted to nothing less than legal counterfeiting of a national currency for private gain. Unfortunately, nearly every nation now has a privately controlled central bank using the Bank of England as the basic model. Such is the power of these central banks that they soon take total control over a nation's economy. It soon amounts to nothing but a plutocracy, 
rule by the rich. It would be like putting control of the army in the hands of the mafia. The danger of tyranny would be extreme. Yes, we need central banks. No, we do not need them in private hands. The central bank scam is really a hidden tax. The nation sells bonds to the central bank to pay for things it does not have the political will to raise taxes to pay for. But the bonds are purchased with money the central bank creates out of nothing. More money in circulation makes your money worth less. The government gets as much money as it needs, and the people pay for it in inflation. The beauty of the plan is that not one person in a thousand can figure it out because it's usually hidden behind complex-sounding economics gibberish. With the formation of the Bank of England, the nation was soon awash in money. Prices throughout the country doubled. Massive loans were granted for just about any wild scheme. One venture proposed to drain the Red Sea to recover gold supposedly lost when the Egyptian army drowned pursuing Moses and the Israelites. By 1698, government debt grew from the initial one and a quarter million pounds to 16 million pounds. Naturally, taxes were increased and then increased again to pay for all of this. With the British money supply firmly in their grip, the British economy began a wild roller coaster series of booms and depressions, exactly the sort of thing a central bank claims it is determined to prevent. There are two things which I think are intrinsic, not just to the Bank of England, but to central banking generally. The first is an involvement in the formulation of monetary policy with the specific objective of achieving monetary stability. However, since the Bank of England took control, the British pound has rarely been stable. Now let's take a look at the role of the Rothschild family, the family said to be the wealthiest in the world. This is Frankfurt, Germany. Fifty years after the Bank of England opened its doors, a goldsmith named Amschel Moses Bauer opened a coin shop, a counting house, in 1743. And over the door, he placed a sign depicting a Roman eagle on a red shield. The shop became known as the Red Shield Firm, or in German, Rothschild. When his son, Amschel Meyer Bauer, inherited the business, he decided to change his name to Rothschild. Amschel soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amsho Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21 in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. His fourth son, Carl, went to Naples, and his fifth son, Jacob, went to Paris. In 1785, Mayor Amschel moved his entire family to this larger house, a five-story dwelling he shared with the Schiff family. This house was known as the Green Shield. The Rothschilds and the Schiffs would play a central role in the rest of European financial history and in that of the United States. The Rothschilds broke into...